Hello guys, my name is Cameron Ayana, and I'm back with you guys with another book called The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming by David Wallace Wells. Um, just to have some comments before I start reading, uh, climate change is real. <laughs> um... I don't understand, like, why there's still people who don't believe in it, but I believe, like, after reading this book, people can be, like, more well-informed about climate change and more willing to stop polluting and become uh, zero waste. So we're going to get started with chapter one, which is called... Cascades. It is worse, much worse than you think. The slowness of climate change is a fairy tale, perhaps a pernicious as one that says it isn't happening at all, and comes to us bundled with several others in an anthology of confronting delusions that global warming is an Arctic saga unfolding remotely, that it is strictly a matter of sea level and coastlines, not in an uh, enveloping crisis, sparring no place and leaving no life undeformed. That it, <clears throat> that it is a crisis of the natural world, not the human one, that those two are distinct, and that we live today somehow outside or beyond or at the very last defended against nature, not inescapably within and literally overwhelmed by it, that wealth can be a shield against the ravages of warming that the burning of fossil fuels is the price of continued economic growth, that growth and the technology it produces will allow us to engineer our way out of environmental disaster, that there is any analog to the scale or scope of this threat. In the long span of human history, that might give us confidence in staring it in staring it down none of this is true but let's begin with the speed of change the, the earth has experienced five mass extinctions before the one we are living through now each so complete a whipping of the fossil record that is that it functioned as a evolutionary reset. The planet's phylogenetic tree first expanding, then collapsing at intervals like a lung. 86% of all species dead. 40, 400, 450 million years ago, 70 million years later, 75%. 125 million years later, 96%. 50 million years later, 80%. 135 million years later, 75% again. Unless you are a teenager, you probably read in your high school textbooks that these extinctions were the result of asteroids. In fact, all but one that killed the dinosaurs involved climate change produced by greenhouse gas. The most notorious was 250 million years ago. It began when carbon dioxide warmed the planet by five degrees Celsius, accelerated when that warming triggered the release of methane, another greenhouse gas, and ended with all but a silver of life on Earth dead. We are currently adding carbon to the atmosphere at a 
<clears throat> considerably faster rate, by most estimates, at least 10 times faster. The rate is 100 times faster than at any point in human history before the beginning of industrialization. And there is already, right now, fully a third more carbon in the atmosphere than at any point in the last 800,000 years. Perhaps in as long as 15 million years. There were no humans then. The oceans were more than 100 feet higher. Many perceive global warming as a sort of moral and economic debt. Accumulated since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and now come due after several centuries. In fact, more than half of the carbon exhaled into the atmosphere by the burning of fossil fuels has been emitted in just the past three decades. Which means we have done, so, we have done as much damage to the fate of the planet and its ability to sustain human life and civilization since A1 Gore published his first book on climate then in all the centuries, all the millennia that came before. The United, State, the United Nations established its climate change framework in 1992, advertising scientific consensus unmistakably to the world. This means we have now engineered as much ruin knowingly as we ever managed in ignorance. Global warming may seem like a distinted morality tale playing out over several centuries and inflicting a kind of Old Testament tribute, <clears throat> retribution on the great-great-grandchildren of those responsible. Since it was carbon burning in 18th century England that lit the fuse of everything that has followed, but that is a fable about historical validity that acquits those of us alive today and unfairly, unfairly. The majority of the burning has come since the premiere of Scene Field. Since the end of World War II, the figure is about 85%. The story of the industrial world's kamikaze mission in the story of a single lifetime, the planet brought from seemingly st stability to the brink of catastrophic of catastrophe and the years between a baptism or bar mitzvah and a funeral. We all know those lifetimes. When my father was born in 1938, among his first memories of the news of Pearl Harbor and the mythic Air Force of the industrial propaganda, propaganda films that followed. The climate change system appeared, to most human observers, steady. Scientists had understood the greenhouse effect, had understood the way carbon produced by burned wood and coal and oil could hothouse the planet and disequilibrate everything on it for three quarters of a century. But they had not yet seen the impact, not really, not yet, which made warming seem less like an observed fact than a dark prophecy to be fulfilled only in a very distinct, distant future, perhaps never. By the time my father died in 2016, weeks after the desperate signing of the Paris Agreement, the climate system was tipping toward devastation, passing the threshold of carbon concentration, 400 parts per million, in 
in the Earth's atmosphere. In the eerily banal language of climatology that had been for years, the bright red line environmental scientists had drawn in the rampaging face of modern industry, saying, do not cross. Of course, we kept going. Just two years later, we hit a monthly average of 411, and guilt saturates the planet's air as much as carbon, though we choose to believe we do not breathe it. The single lifetime is also the lifetime of my mother, born in 1945 to German Jews fleeing the smoke stacks through which their relatives were incinerated and now enjoying her 73rd year in an American commodity paradise, a paradise supported by the factories of a developing world that has in the space of a single lifetime too, <clears throat> manufactured its way into the global middle class. With all the consumer enticements and fossil fuel privileges that come with that ascent, electricity, private cars, air travel, red meat, she has been smoking for 58 of those years, unfiltered, ordering the cigarettes now by the carton from China. It is also the lifetime of many of the scientists who first raised public alarm about climate change, some of whom increase, increasingly remain working. That is how rapidly we have arranged, arrived at this promontory, Roger Revel, who first hurdled the heating of the planet, died in 1991. But Wallace Smith Bro Broecker, who helped popularize the term global warming, still drives to work at the Lemont Doherty Earth Observatory across the Hudson every day from the Upper West Side, sometimes picking up lunch at his old Jersey filling station, recently outfitted as a hipster eatery. In the, 1990, in the 1970s, he did his research with funding from Exxon, a company now the target of a raft of lawsuits, lawsuits that aim to adjudicate responsibility for the rolling emissions regime that today, barring a change, of course, on fossil fuels threatens to make parts of the planet more or less unlivable for humans by the end of this century. That is the course we are speeding so bl blitheringly along to more than four degrees Celsius of warming by the year 2100. According to some estimates, that would mean that whole regions of Africa and Australia and the United States, parts of South America, North Patagonia and Asia, south of Siberia, would be rendered uninhabitable by direct heat, desertification, and flooding. Certainly, it would make them inhospitable, and many more regions besides. This is our itinerary, our baseline, which means that if the planet was brought to the brink of climate catastrophe within the lifetime of a single generation, the responsibility to 
celebrated belongs with a single generation too. We all also know that second lifetime, it is ours. I am not an environmentalist and don't think of myself as a nature person. I've lived my whole life in cities, enjoying gadgets built by industrial supply chains. I hardly think twice about. I've never gone camping, not willingly anyway. And while I always thought it was basically a good idea to keep streams clean and air clear, I also always accepted the proposition that there was a trade-off between economic growth and cost to nature <clears throat> and figured, well, in most cases, I'd probably go for growth. I'm not about to personally slaughter a cow to eat a hamburger, but I'm also not about to go vegan. I tend to think when you're at the top of the food chain, it's okay to flaunt it because I don't see <clears throat> because I don't see anything complicated about drawing a moral boundary between us and other animals. And in fact, find it offensive to women and people of color that all of a sudden, there's talk of extending human rights like legal protections to chimps, apes, and octopuses. Just a generation or two after we finally broke the white male monopoly on legal personhood. In these ways, many of them, at least, I am like every other American who has spent their life fatally complacent and willing and willfully deluded about climate change, which is not just the biggest threat hum of human life on the planet has ever faced, but a threat of an entirely different category and scale. That is the scale of the human life itself. A few years ago, I began collecting stories of climate change, many of them terrifying, gripping, uncanny narratives, with even the most small-scale sagas playing like fables, a group of Arctic scientists trapped when melting ice isolated their research center on an island um, populated also by a group of polar bears. A Russian boy killed by anthrax released from a thawing reindeer carcass, which had been trapped in permafrost for many decades. At first, it seemed the news was inventing a new genre of allegory. But of course, climate change is not an allegory. Beginning in 2011, about 1 million Syrian refugees were unleashed on Europe by a civil war inflamed by climate change and drought. And in a very real sense, much of the populist moment the entire West is passing through now is the result of panic produced by the shock of those migrants. The likely flooding of Bangladesh threatens to create 10 times as many or more received by a world that will be even further destabilized by climate chaos. And one suspects less receptive, the browner those in need. And then there will be the refugees from Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and the rest of South Asia, 140 million by 2050. The World Bank estimates, meaning more than 100 times Europe, Europe's Syrian, Syrian crisis. The UN projections are bleaker. 
200 million climate refugees by two by 2050. 200 million was the entire world population at the peak of the Roman Empire. If you can imagine every single person alive and living anywhere on the planet at that time, dispossessed of their home and turned outward to wander through hostile territories in search of a new one. The high end of what's possible in the next 30 years. The United Nations says, in considerably worse, a billion or more vulnerable poor people with little choice but to fight or flee. A billion or more. That was the entire global population as recently as 1820. With the Industrial Revolution well underway, which suggests that we might better conceive of history not as deliberate procession of years marching forward on a timeline, but as an expanding balloon of population growth, humanity delating across the planet almost to the point of full eclipse. One reason carbon emissions have accelerated so much in the last generation is also an explanation for why history seems to be proceeding so much faster. With so much more happening everywhere, each year, even every day, this is what results when there are simply that many more humans around. 15% of all human experience throughout history, it's been estimated, belongs to people alive right now, each walking the earth with carbon footprints. Those refugees figures are high-end estimates produced years ago by research groups designed to call attention to a particular cause or crusade the true members the true numbers will almost surely fall short of them and scientists tend to trust projections in the tens of millions rather than the hundreds of millions but that those bigger numbers are only the far upper reaches of what is possible should not lull us into complacency when we dismiss the worst case possibilities and distorts our sense of likelier outcomes, which we then regard as extreme scenarios, we, needed, we needn't plan so <clears throat> consciously for. High end estimates establish the boundaries of what's possible between which we can better conceive of what is likely, and perhaps they will prove better guides even than that. Considering the optimists have never, in the half century of climate anxiety we've already endured, been right. My file of stories grew daily, but very few of the clips even those drawn from new research published in the most pedigreed scientific journals seem to appear in the coverage about climate change the country watched on television and read in its newspapers. In those places, climate change was reported, of course, and even with some tinnage of alarm. But the discussion of possible effects was misleadingly narrow, limited almost invariably to the matter of sea level rise. Just as worrisome, the coverage was sand genuine, all things considered. As recently as the 1997 signing of the landmark Um, Kyoto Protocol, two degrees Celsius of global warming, 
was considered the threshold of catastrophe. Flooded cities, crippling droughts and heat waves, a planet battered daily by hurricanes and monsoons we used to call natural disasters, but will soon normalize as simply bad weather. More recently, the foreign minister of the Marshall Islands offered another name for that level of warming, genocide. There is almost no chance we will avoid that scenario. The Kyoto Protocol achieved practically nothing in the 20 years since. Despite all of our climate advocacy and legislation and progress on green energy, we have produced more emissions than in the 20 years before. In 2016, the Paris Accords established two degrees as a global goal. And to read our newspapers, the level of warming remains something like the scariest scenario it is responsible to consider. Just a few years later, with no single industrial nation on track to meet its Paris commitments, two degrees looks more like a best case outcome. At present, hard to credit, with an entire bell curve of more horrific possibilities extending beyond it and yet shrouded delicately from public view. For those telling stories about climate, such horrific possibilities and the fact that we had squandered our chance of landing anywhere on the better half of that curve had become somehow unseemly to consider. The reasons are not, <clears throat> the reasons are almost too many to count. And so half formed, they might better be called impulses. We chose not to discuss a world warmed beyond two degrees out of decency, perhaps, or simple fear, or fear of fear mongering or technocratic faith, which is really market faith, or deference to partisan debates, or even partisan priorities, or skepticism about the environmental left of the kind I'd always had, or disinterest in the fates of distant ecosystems like I'd always had. We felt confusion about the science and its many technical terms and hard to parse numbers, or at least in institution, no, at least in intuition that others would be easily confused about the science and its many technical terms and hard to parse numbers. We suffered from slowness, uh, apprehending the speed of change, or semi-conspiritual com confidence in the responsibility of global elites and their institutions, or obedience, I'm sorry, or obeisance toward those elites and their institutions. Whatever we thought of them, perhaps we felt unable to really trust scarier projections because we'd only just heard about warming. We thought, and things couldn't possibly have gotten that much worse just since the first incovient truth. Or because we liked driving our cars and eating our beef and living as we did in every other way and didn't want to think too hard about that or because we felt a post-industrial we could have <clears throat> we couldn't believe we were still drawing material breaths from fossil fuel finances <clears throat> 
perhaps it was because we were so psychopathically good at collating bad news into a sickening, evolving sense of what constituted normal, or because we looked outside and things seemed still today, still okay. Because we were bored with writing or reading the same story again and get again and again, because climate was so global and therefore non-tribal, it suggested only the corniest politics. Because we didn't yet appreciate how fully it would ravage our lives, and because selfishly we didn't mind destroying the planet for others living elsewhere on it or those not yet born who would inherit it inherit it from us outraged because we had too much faith in the tech <clears throat> in the teleological shape of history and the arrow of human progress to countenance the idea that the arc of history would bend toward anything but environmental justice. Two, because when we were being really honest with ourselves, we already thought of the world as a zero-sum resource competition and believed that whatever happened, we were probably going to continue to be the victors. Relatively speaking, anyway, advantages of class being what they are and our own luck in the natalist lottery being what it is. Perhaps we were too panicked about our own jobs and industries to fret about the future of jobs and industry, or perhaps. We were all like, <clears throat> we were also really afraid of robots, or were too busy looking at our new phones, or perhaps, however, easy we found the apocalypse reflex in our culture and the path of panic in our politics. We truly had a good news bias when it came to the big picture. Or really, who knows why? There are so many aspects to the climate um, kaleidoscope that transforms our institutions, intuitions about environmental devastation into an uncanny complacency that it can be heard to pull the whole picture of climate distortion into focus. But we simply wouldn't or couldn't or anyway didn't look squarely in the face of the science. This is not a book about the science of warming. It is about the... But what is... But what does the science say? It is complicated research because it is, it is built on two layers of uncertainty. What humans will do, mostly in terms of emitting greenhouse gases, and how the climate will respond, both through straightforward, straightforward heating and a variety of more complicated and sometimes contradictory feedback loops. But even shaded by those uncertainty bars in it, also very clear research, in fact, terrifyingly clear, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, offers the gold standard assessments of the state of the planet and the likely trajectory of climate change gold standard in part because it is conservative integrating 
only new research that passes the threshold of inaugurably inaugurability. A new report is expected in 2022, but the most recent one says that if we take action on emissions soon, instituting immediately all of the commitments made in the Paris Accords, but nowhere yet actually implemented, we are likely to get about 3.2 degrees of warming or about three times as much warming as the planet has seen since the beginning of the industrialization. Bringing the unthinkable collapse of the planet's ice sheets, not just into the relaying of the real, but into the present. That would eventually flood not just Miami and Dhaka, but Shanghai and Hong Kong, and a hundred other cities around the world. The tipping point for the collapse is said to be around two degrees, according to several recent recent studies. Even a rapid cessation of carbon emissions could bring us that amount of warming by the end of the century. <clears throat> The assaults of climate change do not end at 200, at 200, sorry, at 2,100. Just because most modeling by convention sunsets at that point. This is why some studying global warming call the hundred years to follow the century of hell. Climate change is fast much faster than it seems we have the capacity to recognize and acknowledge. But it also long, almost longer than we can truly imagine. In reading about warming, you will often come across analogies from the planetary record. The last time the planet was this much warmer, the logic runs, sea levels were here. These conditions are not coins, coincidences. The sea level was there largely because the planet was that much warmer. And the geologic record is the best model we have for understanding the very complicated climate system and gauging <clears throat> just how much damage will come from turning up the temperature by two or four or six degrees, which is why it is especially concerning that recent research into the deep history of the planet suggests that our current climate models may be underestimating the amount of warming we are due for in 2100. By as much as half, in other words, temperatures could rise ultimately by as much as double what the IPCC predicts. Hit or Paris emissions targets, and we may still get four degrees of warming, meaning a green Sahara and the planet's tropical forest transformed into fire-dominated savanna. The authors of one recent paper suggested the warming could be more drastic still. Slashing our emissions could still bring us to four or five degrees Celsius. A scenario they said would pose severe risk to the habitability of the entire planet. Hot house earth, they called it. Because these numbers are so small, we tend to trivialize the differences between them, one, two, four, five. Human experience and memory offer no good analog analogy for how we should think of those thresholds. <clears throat> 
But as with world wars or recurrences of cancer, you don't want to see even one. At two degrees, the ice sheets will begin their collapse. 400 million more people will suffer from water scarcity. Major cities in the equatorial band of the planet will become unlivable, and even the northern latitudes heat waves will kill thousands each summer. There would be 32 times as many extreme heat waves in India, and each would last five times as long, exposing 93 times more people. This is our best case scenario. At three degrees, Southern Europe would be in permanent drought and the average drought in Central America would last 19 months longer and in the Caribbean, 21 months longer. In Northern Africa, the figure is 60 months longer, five years. The acres I mean, sorry, the areas burned each year by wildfires would double in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean and sextuple or more in the United States. At four degrees, there would be eight million more cases of dengue fever every year, each year in Latin America alone and close to annual global food crisis. There could be 9% more heat-related deaths. Damages from river flooding would grow 30-fold in Bangladesh, 20-fold in India, and as much as 60-fold in the United Kingdom. In certain places, six climate driven natural disasters could strike simultaneously and globally damages could pass 600 tr trillion more than twice the wealth as exists in the world today conflict and warfare could double even if we pull the planet up short of two degrees by 2100, we will be left with an atmosphere that contains 500 parts per million of carbon, perhaps more. The last time that was the case, 16 million years ago, the planet was not two degrees warmer. It was somewhere between five and eight, giving the planet about 130 feet of sea level rise enough to draw a new American coastline as far as as <clears throat> 1 to 95. Some of these processes take thousands of years to unfold, but they are also irreversible and therefore effectively permanent. You might hope to simply reverse climate change. You can't. It will outrun all of us. This is part of what makes climate change what the theorist Timothy Morton calls a hyper object, a conceptual fact so large and complex that, like the internet, it can never be properly, properly comprehended. There are many features of climate change, its size, its scope, its brutality that along satisfy this definition. Together, they might <clears throat> elevate it into a higher and more incomprehensible conceptual category yet. But time is perhaps the most mind-bending feature, the worst outcomes arriving so long from now that we reflexively discount their reality. Yet those outcomes promise to mock us and our own sense of the real in return. The ecological dramas we have unleashed 
through our land use and burning fossil fuels slowly about a century and very rapidly for only a few decades will play out over many millennia. In fact, over a longer span of time than, hun than humans have even been around, performed in part by creatures and in environments we do not yet even know, ushered into the world stage by the force of warming. And so, in a conven convenient cognitive bargain, we have chosen to consider climate change only as it will present itself this century. By 2100, the United Nations says we are due for about 4.5 degrees of warming. Following the path we are on today, that is, farther from the Paris tract than the Paris tract is from the two degree threshold of catastrophe, which it more than doubles. As Naomi <clears> Oriquez <throat> has noted, there are far too many uncertainties in our models to take their predictions as gospel. Just running those numbers many times as Gernot Wang, Wagner and Martin Wietzman do in their book, Climate Shock, yields an 11% chance we overshot six degrees. Recent work by the Nobel Laurentide William Nordhaus suggests that better than anticipated economic growth means better than one in three odds that our emissions will exceed the UN's worst case, business as usual scenario. In other words, a temperature rise of five degrees or possibly more. The upper end of probability curve put forward by the UN to estimate the end of the century business as usual scenario, the worst case outcome of a worst case emissions path puts us at eight degrees. At the temperature, humans at the equator and in the tropics would not be able to move around outside without dying. In that world, eight degrees warmer, direct heat effects would be the least of it the oceans would eventually swell into 100 in swell 200 feet higher flooding what we are now two-thirds of the world's major cities hardly any land on the planet would be capable of efficiently producing any of the food we now eat forests would be roiled by rolling storms of fire, and coasts would be punished by more and more intense hurricanes. The suffocating hood of tropical disease would reach northward to enclose parts of what we now call the Arctic. Probably about a third of the planet would be made unlivable by direct heat, and what are today literally un unpresented and intolerable droughts and heat waves would be the quotidian condition of whatever human life was able to endure. We will almost certainly avoid eight degrees of warming. In fact, several recent papers have suggested the climate is actually less sensitive to emissions than we thought, and that even the upper bound of a business as usual path would bring us to about five degrees, with a likely destination around four. But five degrees is nearly in, as unthinkable as eight, and four degrees not much better. The world in a permanent food 
the Fissent, the Alps as arid as the Atlas Mountains. Between the scenario and the world we live in now lies only the open question of human response. Some amount of further warming is already baked in, thanks to protracted processes by which the planet adapts to greenhouse gas. But all of those paths projected from the present to two degrees, to three, to four, to five, or even eight, will be carved overwhelmingly by what we choose to do now. There is nothing stopping us from four degrees other than our own will to change course, which we have yet to display. But the planet is as big as it is and as ecologically diverse because humans have proven themselves an adaptable species and will likely continue to adapt to outmaneuver a lethal threat and because the devastating effects of warming will soon become too extreme to ignore or deny if we if they haven't already because of all that it is unlikely that climate change will render the planet truly uninhabitable but if we do not do nothing i mean but if we do nothing about carbon emissions if the next 30 years of industrial activity trace the same arc upward as the last 30 years have whole regions will become unlivable by any standard we have today as soon as the end of this century a few years ago e o wilson proposed a term half earth to help us think through how we might adapt to the pressures of a changing climate letting nature run its rehab rehab course on half the planet and sequestering humanity in the remaining habitable half of the world. The fraction may be smaller than that, possibly considerably and not by choice. The subtitle of his book was Our Planet's Fight for Life. On longer time scales, the even bleaker outcome is possible. Two, the livable planet darkening as it approaches a human dusk. It would take a spectacular coincidence of bad choices and bad luck to make that kind of zero earth possible within our lifetime. But the fact that we have brought that nightmare eventuality into play as all is perhaps the overwhelmingly cultural and historical fact of the modern era. What historians of the future will likely study about this and what we have hoped the generations before ours would have had the foresight to focus on too whatever we do to stop warming and however aggressively we act to protect ourselves from its ravages we will have pulled the devastation of human life on earth into view close enough that we can see clearly what it would look like and know with some degree of precision how it will punish our children and grandchildren. Close enough, in fact, that we are already beginning to feel its effects ourselves. Even we, <clears throat> even we do not turn away. It is almost hard to believe just how much has happened and how quickly. In the late summer of 2017, Three major hurricanes arose in the Atlantic at once, proceeding at first along the same route as though they were 
battle lions of an army on the march. Hurricane Harvey, when it struck Hudson, delivered such an epic rainfall, it was described in some areas as a 500,000 year event, meaning that we should expect that amount of rain to hit the area once every 500 millennia. Sophisticated consumers of environmental news have already learned how meaningless climate change has rendered such terms, which were meant to describe storms that had a 1 in 500,000 chance of striking in any given year. But the figures do help in this way to remind us just how far global warming has already taken us from any natural disaster benchmark our grandparents would have recognized. To dwell on the more common 500-year figure just for a moment, it would mean a storm that struck once during the entire history of the Roman Empire. 500 years ago, there were no English settlements across the Atlantic, so we are talking about a storm that should hit just once as Europeans arrived and established colonies, as colonialists fought a revolution and Americans a civil war and two world wars as their descendants established an empire of cotton on the backs of slaves, freed them, and then brutalized their descendants, industrialized and post-industrialized, Trump triumphed the Cold War, ushered in the end of history, and witnessed, just a decade later, its dramatic return. One storm in all that time is what the meteorological record has taught us to accept. <clears throat> to expect just one. Harvey was the third such flood to hit Houston since 2015, and the storm struck in places with an intensity that was supposed to be a thousand times rarer still. That same season, an Atlantic hurricane hit Ireland 45 million were flooded from their homes in South Asia, and unprecedented wildfires tilled much of California into ash. And then there was the new category of quotidian nightmare, climate change inventing the once unimaginable category of obscure natural disasters crisis, so large they would once have been inscribed in folklore for centuries today passing across our horizons, ignored, overlooked, or forgotten. In 2016, a hundred-year flood drowned small town <clears throat> Elotcott City, Maryland, to take but one example, almost at random, it was followed two years later in the same small town by another. One week that summer of 2018, dozens of places all over the world were hit with a record heat waves from Denver to Berling Burlington to Ottawa, from Glasgow to Shannon, to Belfast, from Tbilisi in Georgia, and your Irvin in Armenia, to, <clears throat> to whole swaths of southern Russia. The previous month, the daytime temperature of one city in Oman reached above 121 degrees Fahrenheit and did not drop below 108 all night. And in 
Quebec, Canada, 54 died from the heat. In that same week, 100 major wildfires burned in the American West, including one in California that grew 4,000 acres in one day, and another in Colorado that produced a volcano-like 300-foot eruption of flames, swallowing an entire subdivision and inventing a new term, fire tsunami. Along the way, on the other side of the planet, biblical rains flooded Japan, where 1.2 million were evacuated from their homes. Later that summer, Typhoon Meng Hut forced the evacuation of 2.45 million from mainland China. The same week that Hurricane Florence struck the Carolinas, turning the port city of Wilmington briefly into an island and flooding large parts of the state with long with hog manure and coal ash. Along the way, the winds of Florence produced dozens of tornadoes across the region. The previous month in India, the state of Kar- Kerala was hit with its worst floods in almost a hundred years. That October, a hurricane in the Pacific whipped Hawaii's East Island entirely off the map. And in November, which has traditionally marked the beginning of the rainy season in California, the state was hit instead with the deadliest fire in its history, the Camp Fire, which scorched several hundred square miles outside of Chico, killing dozens and leaving many more missing in a place called Pro Proverse Proverbili Paradise. The devastation was so complete you could almost forget the Wolseley fire closer to Los Angeles, which burned at the same time and forced the sudden evacuation of 170,000. And it was, it is tempting to look at these strings of disasters and think climate change is here. And one response to seeing things long predicted actually come to pass is to feel that we have settled into a new era with everything transformed. In fact, that that is how California Governor Jerry Brown described the state of things in the mildest of the state's wildfire disaster, a normal, a new normal. The truth is actually much scarier. That is the end of normal, never normal again. We have already exceeded the state of environmental conditions that allowed the human animal to evolve in the first place. And an unsure and unplanned bet on just what that animal can endure. The climate system that raised us and raised everything we know, we now know as human culture and civilization is now like a parent dead. And the climate system we have been observing for the last several years, the one that has battered the planet again and again, is not our bleak future in preview. It would be more precise to say that it is a product of our recent climate past, already passing behind us into a dustbin of environmental nostalgia. There is no longer any such thing as a natural disaster, but only, but not only will things get worse, technically speaking, they have already gotten worse. Even if miraculously humans immediately ceased 
emitting carbon, we'd still be due for some additional warming from just the stuff we've put into the air already. And of course, with global emissions still increasing, we've very far from, zero, from zeroing out on carbon and therefore very far from stalling climate change. The devastation we are now seeing all around us is a beyond best case scenario for the future of warming and all the climate disasters it will bring. What that means is that we have not at all arrived at a new equilibrium. It is more like we've taken one step out of the plank of off a pirate ship, perhaps because the exhausting false debate about whether climate change is real, too many of us have developed a misleading impression that its effects are binary. But global warming is not yes or no, nor is it today's weather forever or doomsday tomorrow. It is a function that gets worse over time as long as we continue to produce greenhouse gas. And so the experience of life in a climate transformed by human activity is not just a matter of stepping from one stable ecosystem into another, somewhat worse than one, I mean, somewhat worse one, no matter how degraded or destructive the transformed climate is, the effects will grow and build as the planet continues to warm from one degree to 1.5 to almost certainly two degrees and beyond. The last few years of climate disasters may look like about as much as the planet can take. In fact, we are only just entering our brave new world, one that collapses below us as soon as we set foot on it. Many of these new disasters arrived accompanied by debate about their case, about how much of what they have done to us comes from what we have done to the planet. For those hoping to better understand precisely how a monstrous hurricane arises out of a plastic, placid ocean, these inquiries are worthwhile. For all practical proposes, the debate yields no real meaning or insight. A particular hurricane may owe 40% of its force to anthropogenic global warming. For those who don't know, anthropogenic means human, um, just like all humans. The evolving models might suggest in a particular drought may be half again as bad as it might have been in the 17th century. But climate change is not a discrete clue <clears throat> we can find at the scene of a local crime. One hurricane, one heat wave, one famine, one war. Global warming isn't a perpetra perpetrator it's a conspiracy. We all live within climate and within all the changes we have produced in it, which enclose us all in everything we do. If hurricanes of a certain force are now five times as likely as in the pre-Columbian Caribbean, it is parsimonious to the point of Trivility to argue over whether this one, this one, or that one was climate caused. All hurricanes now unfold in the weather systems we have wrecked on their behalf, which is why there are more of them and why they are stronger. The same is true for wildfires. This one. This one or that one may be caused by a cookout or a 
or donned power line, a downed power line, but each is burning faster, bigger, and longer because of global warming, which gives no <clears throat> rep reprieve to fire season. Climate change isn't something happening here or there, but everywhere and all, all at once. And unless we choose to halt it, it will never stop. Over the past few decades, the term Anthropocene has climbed out of academic discourse and into the popular imagination, a name given to the geologic era we live in now, and a way to signal that it is a new era, defined on the wall chart of deep history by human intervention. One problem with the term is that it implies a conquest of nature, even echoing in biblical dom dominion. But however sanguine you might be about the proposition that we have already ravaged the natural world, which we surely have. It is another thing entirely to consider the possibility that we have only provoked it, engineering first in ignorance and then in denial. A climate system that will now go to war with us for many centuries, perhaps until it destroys us. That is what Wally Broecker, the Avu, Avuan Schuller oceanographer, means when he calls the planet an angry beast. You could also go with war machine. Each day we arm it more. The assaults will not be discreet. This is another climate delusion. Instead, they will produce a new kind of cascading violence, waterfalls and avalanches of devastation. The planet pummeled again and again with increasing intensity and in ways that build on each other and undermine our ability to respond, uprooting much of the landscape we have taken for granted for centuries as the stable foundation on which we walk, build homes and highways, shepherd our children through schools and into adulthood under the promise of safety, but subverting the promise that the world we have engineered and built for ourselves out of nature will also protect us against it rather than conspiring with disaster against its makers. Consider those California wildfires. In March 2018, Santa Barbara County issued mandatory evacuation orders for those living in Montecito, Gloetta, Santa Barbara, Summerland, and Carpinteria where the previous December's fires had hit hardest in what in ways the fourth ec evacuation order pre precipitated by a climate event in the country in just three months, but only the first had been on fire. The others were for mudslides ushered into possibility by that fire. One of the tawniest communities in the most glamorous state of the world's pre eminently powerful country appended appended by fear that their world's <clears throat> but their toy vineyards and hobby stables, their world-class beaches and lavishly founded public schools would be 
un inundated by rivers of mud. The community as thoroughly ravaged as the spiraling camps of temporary shacks housing Rohingya refugees from my Myanmar in the monsoon region of Bangladesh. It was more than a dozen died, including a toddler swept away by mud and cried miles down the mountain slope to the sea. Schools closed and highways flooded, foreclosing the routes of emergency vehicles and making the community an, an inland island as if beyond a blockade choked off by a mud nose by a mud noose. Some climate cascades will unfold at the global level, cascades so large their effects will seem by the curious linger demon domain of environmental change. Imperceptible a warming planet leads to a melting Arctic ice, which mean less sunlight reflected back to the sun and more absorbed by a, by a planet warming faster still, which means an ocean less able to absorb atmospheric carbon and so a planet warming faster still. A warming planet will also melt Arctic permafrost, which contains 1.8 trillion tons of carbon, more than twice as much as is currently suspended in the Earth's atmosphere, and some of which, when it thaws and is released, may evaporate as methane, which is 34 times a powerful um a as powerful as greenhouse gas warming blanket as carbon dioxide when judged on the time scale of a century when judged on the time scale of two decades it is 86 times as powerful a hotter planet is on net bad for planet life which means what is called forest dieback the decline and retreat of jungle basins as big as countries and woods that sprawl for so many miles. They used to contain whole folklores, which means a dramatic stripping back of the planet's natural ability to absorb carbon and turn it into oxygen, which means still hotter temperatures, which means more dieback, and so on. Higher temperatures means more forest fires, means fewer trees, means less carbon absorption, means more carbon in the atmosphere, means a higher planet still, and so on. A warmer planet means more water vapor in the atmosphere, and water vapor being a greenhouse gas, this brings higher temperatures still, and so on. Warmer oceans can absorb less heat, which means more stays in the air and contains less oxygen, which is doomed for phytoplankton, which does for the ocean what plants do on land, eating carbon and, uh, and producing oxygen which leaves us with more carbon, which heats the planet further, and so on. These are the systems climate scientists call feedbacks. They are more. There are more. Some work in the other direction, moderizing, <clears throat> moderating climate change, but many more point toward an acceleration of warming. We would should we trigger them? And just how these complicated 
countervailing systems will interact, what effects will be exaggerated, and what determined by feedbacks is unknown, which pulls a dark cloud of uncertainty over any effort to plan ahead for the climate future. We know what a best case outcome for climate change looks like, however, unrealistic, because it quite closely resembles the world as we live on it today. But we have not yet begun to contemplate those cascades that may bring us to the infernal range of the bell curve. Other cascades are regional, collapsing on human communities and buckling them where they fall. These can be literal cascades, human triggered avalanches on the rise. With, five, with 50,000 people killed by avalanches globally between 2004 and 2016, in Switzerland, climate change is unleashed a whole new kind. This is what are called rain on snow events, which also cause the overflow of the Overville Dam in Northern California and the 2013 flood of Alberta, Canada, with damages approaching $5 billion. But there are other kinds of cascade too. Climate-driven water shortages or crop failures push climate refugees into nearby regions, already struggling with resource scarcity. Sea level rise in undates cropland with more and more saltwater flooding, transforming ag agricultural areas into breakish sponges no longer able to adapt to adequately feed those living on them, off of them. Flooding power plants, knocking regions offline just as electricity may be needed most and crippling and crippling chemical and nuclear plants which manufacture men malfunctioning breathe out the toxic uh, plumes the rains that followed the campfire flooded the tent cities hastily assembled for the first disaster's refugees. In the case of Santa Barbara mudslides, drought, um, drought produced a state full of dry brush ripe for a spark. Then a year of <clears throat> anomalously monsoonish rain produced only more growth and wildfires tore through the landscape leaving a mountain slide without much plant life to hold in place the millions of tons of loose earth that makes up the towering coastal range where the clouds tend to gather and the rain first falls. Soon, some of those watching from afar wondered incredibly <clears throat> how a mudslide could kill so many. The answer is the same way as hurricanes or tornadoes by weaponizing the environment, whether man-made or natural. Wind disasters do not kill by wind, however brutal it gets but by tugging trees out of the earth and transforming them into clubs, making power lines into loose whips and electrified nooses. Collapsing homes on cowering re residents and turning cars into tumbling boulders. And they kill slowly too, by cutting off food delivery and medical supplies, making roads impassable even to first responders, knowing, I mean, knocking out phone lines and cell towers so that 
the ill and elderly must suffer and hope to endure in silence and without aid. Most of the world is not Santa Barbara, with its mission style and pasto of infinite seeming wealth. And in the coming decades, many of the most punishing climate honor, um, horrors will indeed hit those least able to respond and recover. This is what is often called the problem of environmental justice. A sharper, less gauzy phrase would be climate caste system. The problem is acute within countries, even wealthy ones, where the poorest are those who live in the marshes, the swamps, the floodplains, the adequately irrigated places with the most vulnerable infrastructure altogether in unwitting environmental apartheid. Just in Texas, 500,000 poor Latinos live in shanty towns called colonias with no drainage systems to deal with increased flooding. The, cover the cleavage is even sharper globally where the poorest countries will suffer more in our hot new world. In fact, with one exception, Australia, country, countries with lower GDPs will warm the most. That is notwithstanding the fact that much of the global South has not, to this point, defiled the atmosphere of the planet all that much. This is one of the many historical ironies of climate change that would be called cruel cruelties. So, so merciless is the suffering they will inflict. But disproportionately, as it will fall on the world's least, the devastation of global warming cannot be easily quarantined in the developing world as much as those in the Northern Hemisphere would probably, and not to our credit, prefer it. Climate disaster is too indiscriminate for that. In fact, the belief that climate could be possibly governed or managed by any institution or human instruction presently at hand is another wide-eyed climate delusion. The planet survived many millennia without anything approaching a world government. In fact, endured nearly the entire span of human civilization that way, organized into competitive tribes of fiefdoms and kingdoms and nation states and only began to build something resembling a cooperative blueprint, very piecemeal, after brutal world wars in the form of the League of Nations and United Nations and in European Union, and even the market fabric of globalization, whatever its its flaws. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my place. Whatever its flaws, still a vision of cross national participation imbued with the neoliberal ethos that life on earth was a positive sum game. If you had to invent a threat grand enough and global enough, to possibly conjure into being a system of true international cooperation, climate change would be it. The threat everywhere, and overwhelmingly, and total. And yet now, just as the need for that kind of cooperation is paramount, indeed necessary for anything like the world we know to survive, we are only unbuilding those alliances 
recoiling into nationalistic corners and retreating from collective responsibility and from each other. The collapse of trust is a cascade too. Just how completely the world below our feet will become unknown to us is not yet clear. And now we register its transformation remains an open question. One legacy of the environmentalist creed that long, that long prized that long prized the natural world as an otherworldly retreat is that we see its degradation as a sequestered story unfolding separately from our own modern lives, so separately that the degradation acquires the comfortable contours of parable. Like pages from Aesop, asthenticized even when we know the losses as tragedy. Climate change could soon mean that in the fall, trees may simply turn brown. And so we will look differently at entire schools of painting, which stretched for generations, devoting to best capturing the oranges and reds we can no longer see ourselves out the turning <clears throat> out the windows of our our cars as we drive along our highways the coffee plants of latin america will no longer produce fruit beach homes will be built on higher and higher stilts and still be drowned in many cases it is better to use the present tense. In just the last 40 years, according to the World Wildfire Fund, I mean Wildlife Fund, more than half of the world's vertebrate animals have died in just the last 25. One study of German nature preserves found. The flying insect population declined by three quarters. The delicate dance of flowers and their pollinators have been disrupted, as have the migration patterns of cod, which have fled up the eastern sea broad toward the Arctic, evading the communities of fishermen that fed on them for centuries as have the hibernation patterns of black bears, many of which now stay awake all winter. Species individuated over millions of years of evolution, but forced together by climate change, have begun to mate with one another for the first time, producing a whole new class of hybrid species. The prisley bear, the koi wolf, the zoos are already natural history museums. The children's books already out of date. Older fables, too, will be remade. The story of Atlantis, having endured and enchanted for several millennia, will, complete, will compete with the real-time sagas of the Marshall Islands and Miami Beach. Each sinking over time into snorkels paradise paradises the strange fantasy of santa and his polar workshop will grow eerier still in the arctic of ice free summers and there is a terrible pyongnancy in con contemplating how desertification of the entire Mediterranean basin will change our reading of the Odyssey, or how it will discolor the shine of Greek islands for dust from the Sahara to permanently blanket their skies. <clears throat>
or how it will recast the meaning of the pyramids for the Nile to be dramatically drained. We will think of the border with Mexico differently, presumably when the Rico Grande is a line traced through a dry riverbed, the the real sand. It's already been called the imperious West has spent five centuries looking down its nose at the plight of those living within the pale of tropical disease. And one wonders how that will change when mosquitoes carrying malaria and dengue are flying through the streets of Copenhagen and Chicago too. But we have for long understood stories about nature as allegories that we seem unable to recognize that the meaning of the climate change is not sequestered in parable. It encompasses us in a real, in a very real way. It governs us, our crop yields, our pandemics our migration patterns and civil wars, crime waves and domestic assaults, hurricanes and heat waves and rain bombs and mega droughts, the shape of our economic growth and everything that flows downstream from it, which today means nearly everything, 800 million in South Asia alone the World Bank says, would see their living conditions sharply diminished by 2050 on the current emissions track, and perhaps a climate slowdown will even reveal the bounty of what Andreas Malum calls fossil capitalism to be an illusion. Sustained over just a few centuries by a rhythmic of adding the energy value of burned fossil fuels to what had been before wood and coal and oil, an eternal mouthanism, mouth saying trap, in which case we would have to retire the intuition that history will inevitably extract material progress from the planet. At least in any reliable or global pattern and come to terms somehow with just how pervasively the intuition ruled even our inner lives, often tyrannically. Adaptation to climate change is often viewed in terms of market trade-offs, but in the coming decades, the trade will work in the opposite direction. With relative prosperity, a benefit of more aggressive action, every degree of warming, it's been estimated, costs a temperate country like the United States about one percentage point of GDP. And according to one percent one recent paper, at one point five degrees, the world would be twenty trillion dollars richer than at two degrees. Turn the dial up another degree or two, and the cost balloon, the compound interest of environmental catastrophe, three point seven degrees of warming will produce. $551 trillion in damages. Research suggests total worldwide wealth is today about $280 trillion. Our current emissions trajectory takes us over four degrees by 2,100. Multiply that by 1% of GDP and you have almost entirely wiped out the very possible of economic growth, which has not topped 5% globally in over 40 years. 
A fringe group of alarmed academics call this prospect steady state economics, but it ultimately suggests a more complete retreat from economics as in orienting beacon and from growth as the lingua franca through which modern life launders all of its aspirations. Steady state also gives a new, I mean, also gives a name to the creeping panic that history may be less progressive. As we come to believe really only over the last several centuries than cynical, as we sure, as we were sure it was the many millennia before, more than that, in the version, in the vision, steady state economics projects of a state of nature, competitive scramble. Everything from politics to trade and war seems brutally zero sum. For centuries, we have locked, we have looked to nature as a mirror into onto which to first project, then observe ourselves. But what is the moral? There is nothing to learn from global warming because we do not have the time or the distance to contemplate its lessons. We are after all not merely telling the story, but living it. This is trying to, the threat is immense. How immense? One two, <clears throat> one 2018 paper sketches the math in horrifying detail. In the journal, Nature Climate Change, a team led by Drew Schindel tried to quantify the suffering that would be avoided if warming was kept to 1.5 degrees rather than 2 degrees, in other words. How much additional suffering would result from which the, the additional half degree of warming? Their answer, 150 million more people will die from air pollution alone in a two degree warmer world than in a five, than in a 1.5 degree warmer one. Later that year, the IPCC raised the stakes further in the gap between uh, the gap between 1.5 degrees and two. It said hundreds of millions of lives were at stake. Numbers that large can be hard to grasp. About 150 million is equivalent of 25 holocausts. It is three times the size of the death toll of the Great Leap Forward, the largest non-military death toll humanity has ever produced. It is more than twice the greatest death toll of any kind, World War II. The numbers don't begin to climb only when we hit 1.5 degrees, of course, as should not surprise you, they are already accumulating at a rate of at least 7 million deaths from air pollution alone each year in annual holocaust pursued and persecuted by what brand of nihilism. This is what is meant when climate change is caused in existential is called an existential crisis a drama we are now harp haphazardly improvising between two hellish poles in which our best case outcome is death and suffering at the scale of 25 holocausts and the worst case outcome puts us on the brink of extinction <clears throat> 
rhetoric often fails us on climate because the only factually appropriate language is of a kind we've been trained by a buoyant culture of sunny side up optimism to dismiss categorically as hyperbole. Here, the facts are hysterical and the dimensions of the drama that will play out between those poles incomprehensibly large, large enough to enclose not just all of present day humanity, but all of our possible futures as well. Global warming has improbably compressed into two generations the entire story of human civilization. First, the pro- the project of remaking the planet so that it is undeniably ours, a project whose exhaust, the poison of emissions, now cause now casually works its way through millennia of ice so quickly you can see the melt with a naked eye. Destroying the environmental conditions that have held stable and steadily governed for literally all of human history that has been the work of a single generation. The second generation faces a very different task, the project of preserving our collective future, forestalling the devastation and engineering an alternate path. There is simply no analogy to draw on outside of mythology and theology and perhaps the Cold War prospect of mutually assured destruction. Few feel like gods in in the face of warming, but that the totality of climate change should make us feel so passive that is another of its delusions. In folklore and comic books, and church pews and movie theaters, stories about the fate of the earth often perversively counsel passivity in their audiences. And perhaps it should not surprise us that the threat of climate change is no different. By the end of the Cold War, the prospect of nuclear winter had clouded every corner of our pop culture and psychology, a perversive, pervasive nightmare that the human experiment might be brought to an end by two jousting sets of proud, revelorous tactics. Just a few sets of twitchy hands hovering over the planet's self-destruct buttons. The threat of climate change is more dramatic still and ultimately more democratic with responsibility shared by each of us, even as we shiver, shiver in fear of it. And yet we have processed that threat only in parts typically not concretely or explicitly. Displacing certain anxieties and inventing others, choosing to ignore the bleakest features of our possible future and letting our political fatalism and technological faith blur as though we'd gone cross-eyed into a remarkably familiar consumer fantasy that someone else will fix the problem for us at no cost. Those more panicked are often hardly less complacent, living instead through climate fatalism as though it were climate optimism. Over the last few years, as the planet's own environmental rhythms has have seemed to grow more 
fatalistic, fatalistic skeptics have found themselves arguing not that climate change isn't happening since extreme weather has made it undeniable, but that it cause that its causes are unclear, suggesting that the changes we are seeing are the result of natural cycles rather than human activities and interventions. It is a very strange argument. If the planet is warming at a terrifying pace and on a horrifying scale, it should transparently concern us more rather than less. That the warming is beyond our control, possibly even our comprehension. That we know global warming is our doing should be a comfort, not a cause of despair. However, incomprehensibly large and complicated, we find the processes that have brought it into being, that we now, that we know we are ourselves responsible for all of its punishing effects sh should be empowering and not just perversively. Global warming is, after all, a human invention. And the flip side of our real-time guilt is that we remain in command. No matter how out of control the climate system seems, with its whirling typhoons, unprecedented famines and heat waves, refugee crises and climate conflicts, we are all its authors and still writing. Some, like our oil companies and their political patrons, are more prolific, prolific authors than others. But the burden of responsibility is too great, is too great to be shouldered by a few. However confronting it is to think all that is needed is for a few villains to fall. Each of us imposes some suffering on our future selves every time we flip on a light switch, buy a plane ticket, or fail to vote. Now, we all share the responsibility to write the next act. We found a way to engineer devastation, and we can find a way to engineer our way out of it, or rather, engineer our way toward a degraded muddle but one that nevertheless extends forward the promise of new generations finding their own way forward, perhaps toward some brighter environmental future. Since I first began writing about warming, I've often been asked whether I see any reason for optimism. The thing is, I am optimistic. Given the prospect that humans could engineer a climate that is six or even eight degrees warmer over the course of the next several centuries, large swaths of the planet unlivable by any definition we use today, that degraded muddle counts for me as an encouraging future. Warming of three or 3.5 degrees would unleash suffering beyond anything that humans have ever experienced through, through many millennia of strain and strife of all out war. But it is not a fatalistic scenario. In fact, it's a whole lot better than where we are headed. And in the form of carbon capture technology, which would extract CO2 from the air, or geoengineering, which would cool the planet by suspending gas in the atmosphere, or over now, un, now unfaithful innovations, we may conjure new solutions.
which could bring the planet closer to a state we would today regard as merely grim rather than apocalyptic. I've also often been asked whether it's moral to reproduce in this climate, whether it's responsible to have children, whether it is fair to the planet or perhaps more important to the children. As it happens, in the course of writing this book, I did have a child, Broca. Part of that choice was delusion. That same willful blindness, I know there are climate horrors to come, some of which will inevitably be, re be visited by my children. That is what it means for warming to be an all-encompassing, all-touching threat. But those horrors are not yet scripted. We are staging them by inaction. And by action, can stop them. Climate change means some bleak prospects for the decades ahead, but I don't believe the appropriate response to the chain to the challenge is withdrawal or or surrender. I think you have to do everything you can to make the world accommodate dignified and flourishing life rather than giving up early before the fight has been lost or won and accumulating a climate sorry acclimating yourself to a dreary future brought into being by others less concerned about climate pain the fight is definitely not yet lost, in fact, will never be lost, so long as we avoid extinction. Because however warm this planet gets, it will always be the case that the decade that follows could, con could contain more suffering or less. And I have to admit, I am also excited for everything that Roca and her sisters and brothers will see, will witness, will do. She will hit her child rearing years around 2050 when we could have climate refugees in the many tens of millions. She will be entering old age at the close of the century, the end stage bookmark on all of our projections for warming. In between, she will watch the world doing battle with a genuinely existential threat. And the people of her generation making a future for themselves and generations they bring into being on this planet. And she won't just be watching. She will be living it quite literally, the greatest story ever told. It may be it may well bring a happy ending. What cause is there for hope? Carbon hangs in the air for decades with some of the most terrifying feedbacks unspooling over even longer time horizons, which gives warming the eerie shimmer of an unending menace. But climate change is not an ancient crime. We are tasked with solving now. We're destroying our planet every day, often with one hand as we conspire to restore it with the other, which means as Paul Hawken has perhaps illustrated most coheadedly, we can also stop destroying it in the same style collectively, haphazardly, in all the most quotidian ways in addition to the spectacular seeming ones. The project of unplugging the entire industrial world from fossil fuels is intimidating and must be done in fairly shorter, in short order by 2040. Many scientists say, <clears throat> but in the meantime, in the meantime, many avenues are open
wide open if we are not too lazy, too blinkered, and too selfish to embark upon them. Fully half of British admissions, it was recently calculated, come from inefficiencies in construction, discarded and unused food, electronics and clothing. Two thirds of American energy is wasted. Globally, according to one paper, we are subside, subsize, subsizely the fossil fuel business to the tune of $5 trillion each year. None of that has to continue. Slow walking action on climate, another paper found, will cost the world $26, $26 trillion by 2030. That does not have that does not have to continue. Americans waste a quarter of their food, which means that the carbon footprint of the average meal is a third larger than it has to be. That need not continue. Five years ago, hardly anyone outside the darkest corners of the internet had even heard of Bitcoin. By 2018, mining is it, mining it consumes as much electricity as nations like the Netherlands. Before its dramatic crash, it was on track to eat up more electricity than is generated by all of the world's solar panels combined by 2019. It may get there yet. And a simple change to the algorithm could eliminate that Bitcoin footprint entirely. There are just a few of the reasons to believe that what the Canadian activist Stuart Parker has called climate nullism is in fact another of our delusions. What happens from here will be entirely our own doing. The planet's future will be determined in large part by the arc of growth in the developing world. That's where most of the people are, in China and India, and increasingly sub-Saharan Africa. But this is no uh, <clears throat> absolution for the West, where the average citizen produces many times more emissions than most anyone in Asia. Just out of habit, I toss out tons of wasted food and hardly ever recycle. I leave my air conditioning on. I bought into Bitcoin at the peak of their market. None of that is necessary either. But it is also but it also isn't necessary for westerners to adopt the lifestyle of the global poor. 70% of the energy produced by the planet, it's estimated, is lost at, as waste heat. If the average American were confined by the carbon footprint of her European counterpart, U.S. carbon emissions would fall by more than half. If the world's richest 10% were limited to the same footprint, global emissions would fall by a third. And why shouldn't they be almost as the pro prophylactic against climate guilt as the news from science has grown bleaker western liberals have comforted themselves by contouring their own consumption patterns into of moral or environmental purity, less beef, more Teslas, fewer transatlantic flights. But the climate calculus is such that individual lifestyle choices do not add up too much unless they are scaled by politics. America's rump climate party aside that scaling that scaling should not be impossible. Once we understand the stakes, in fact, the stakes mean it must not be.
Annihilation is only the very thin tail of warming's very long bell curve, and there is nothing stopping us from steering clear of it. But what lies between us and extinction is horrifying enough, and we have not yet become, began to contemplate what it means to live under those conditions, what it will do to our politics and our culture and our emotional equilibria, our sense of history and our um, relationship to it, our sense of nature and our relationship to the, it. That we are living in a world degraded by our own hands with the horizon of human possibility dramatically dimmed, we may yet see a climate deus ex machina, or rather, we may yet build one. In the form of carbon capture technology or geoengineering, or in the form of a revolution in the way we generate power, electric or political, but that solution, if it comes at all, will emerge against a bleak horizon darkened by our emissions as if by glaucoma. Especially those who have embedded <clears throat> several centuries of Western triumphalism tend to see the story of human civilization as an inevitable conquest of the earth rather than the saga of an insecure culture like mold growing haphazardly and unsurely upon it. That fragility which pervades now everything humans might do on this planet is the great extensional insight of global warming, but it is only beginning to shake our triumphism, though if we had stopped to contemplate the possibilities in generation in a ger <clears throat> sorry the possibilities a generation ago to probably it probably would not surprise us to see a new form of political nihilism emerging in the region of the world already baked hardest by global warming the Middle East, and expressed there through suicidal um, spasms of theological violence. The region was once called grandly the cradle of civilization. Today, political nihilism radiates almost everything through the many cultures that arose, branching from Middle Eastern roots. We have all already left behind the narrow window of environmental conditions that allowed the human animal to evolve in the first place, but not just evolve. That window has enclosed everything we remember as history and value as progress and study as politics. What will, what will it mean to live outside that window, probably quite far outside it? That reckoning is the subject of this book. None of it is news. The science that makes up the following 12 chapters has been culled from interviews with dozens of experts and from hundreds of papers published in the best academic journals over the previous decade or so. Since it is science, <clears throat> since it is science, it is tentative ever evolving and some of the predictions that follow will surely not come precisely to pass. But it is an honest and fair portrait of the state of our collective understanding of the many multiplying threats that a warming planet poses to all of us presently living, presently living on it and hoping we may continue to do so 
it an indefinite and undisturbed way. Little of it about nature, per se, and none concerns the tragic fate of the planet's animals, which has been written about so elegantly and poetically by others that, like our sea level myopia, it threatens to occlude our picture of what global warming means for us, the human animal. Until now, it seems to have been easier for us to emphasize with the climate plight of other species than our own, perhaps because we have such a hard time acknowledging or understanding our own responsibility and complicity in the changes now unfolding. And such an easier time evaluating the morally simpler calculus of pure victimhood. What follows is instead a Kaley kaleidoscopic accounting of the human costs of human life continuing as it has for a generation, which will fill up the planet with only more humans with on, ongoing, ongoing global warming spells for public health or conflict for politics and food production and pop culture for urban life and mental health and the way we imagine our own futures as we begin to preserve, as we begin to perceive all around us an acceleration of history and the diminishing of possibility that acceleration likely brings. The force of retribution will cascade down to us through nature. But the cost to be in the minority in feeling that the world could lose much of what we think as nature, as far as I cared, so long as we could go on living as we have in the world left behind. This problem is, the problem is, we can't. Okay. So that was the end of our first chapter of the book called The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming by David Wallace. Um, this was chapter one, Cascades. Uh, he had a lot of information and I think we all do need to take it um, as seriously as possible. And I hope that with the continuation of my YouTube channel, that I can reach, that I can reach a broader audience, so that I can um, contribute to the changing of um, human life 